Hello, Patrice Rati. I'm Jazz Galanti, and welcome back to your favorite dental podcast. I told you at the end of last episode that I've been holding a secret trump card all this while. This episode will blow your mind. I mean, it's such a great fun chat. I mean, any episode with Zach Cara, we know we love that one. The main guest we have today who has an interest in law and ethics is Dr. Sean Sellers. Uh, Sean is actually the host of a podcast called Incisive Decisive, and I know you will learn so much from him today. Over this two-part episode, we're going to cover record keeping and emotional intelligence in this episode. And the next one, we're going to talk all about consent and how intricate consent can be. Uh, and they're both really fun chats I, i'm actually when i listened back to them uh, six months after they recorded i was just laughing at myself and the reason why there was a big delay was i was kind of testing some of the softwares and and record keeping uh, best ways to record keep so i'm kind of working on something behind the scenes i'm not starting my own product or anything like that don't worry it's more in the sense of trialing which is the best way to record your notes to so i can make my workflow easier and so far i've been enjoying loom and I'll tell you more about how I'm using Loom as part of presenting treatment plans uh, a bit later uh, in the episode, probably in the middle somewhere. Uh, but what I want you to tell you about the guests that we have on Sean Sellers and Zach and, and the kind of chat we have, it's all about how we can build better rapport and how it's this concept we, we discussed in the podcast of having a different mask. Like we dentists, we wear a different mask for when we're communicating with the receptionist, for when we're communicating with patient A and patient B, we have to wear a different mask mask and that's what makes dentistry really challenging that we have to communicate differently and actually we should be communicating differently to each and every person because every person is unique and if you want to be a really effective communicator I think we all were in agreement in this episode that you have to speak to everyone and communicate to everyone differently. Sean also teaches us about something called the peak end rule I'm not going to tell you what it is listen now it's really cool I think it's really effective it's changed my mindset and I make sure I'm always adhering to the peak end rule and all of the chats we had reminded me of one of my mentors and ex-principals, Dr. Hap Gill. He taught me at a team meeting one day that actually we are kind of in show business, right? Like it doesn't matter if you've had an argument with your spouse. It doesn't matter that uh, someone at home, maybe uh, your child is, is, is got chicken pox or something, okay? It doesn't matter what other problems you're having in your life right now. When you step through into that door, into the surgery, and your patient walks in, you have to present the best version of yourself. You have to forget about everything. I think uh, Finlay Sutton's also quoted this either in a live lecture or on the podcast, I forgot now, but he's also someone who said this, whereby you just have to forget, zone everything else out. You have to give your everything to that patient. Now, not at the expense of your mental health or anything, but i.e. don't let external things affect you inside the surgery and that can be really tough and that's again why our role as a dentist can be so tough. The protrusive dental pearl I have for you before we dive straight to the episode is the following. We discussed in this episode about building rapport and one of the things we discussed was about writing down on your note-taking software a few things, a few quirks, a few memories about your patient. They Maybe they have two children, maybe their favorite team is Manchester United, maybe they like to swim on the weekends, wherever it might be. I think it's a great thing to write down. Uh, I know some of my colleagues who I work with, uh, Susie, if you're listening, I know you're listening, Susie. You're amazing at doing this. Like You're amazing at writing like the, the, everything about their children and the fine detail, and you love that, and your patients love you, right? So I like to also do this where I remember I write down a few couple of things, and I build them up, and I build them up. And in case the first few times you don't quite remember them, you read that information. You can say, oh yeah, uh, how's our team doing now? Or did you go for a swim today? And patients really love it. And I think it's a great way, especially if working in new practice and you're getting to know your patients, this can really accelerate the rapport that you can build with your patients. It's likely that many of you are already doing this, but it's a great reminder to continue. Hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll catch you in the outro. Gentlemen, Sean Sellers, Zach Cara, welcome to another episode of the Patrusa Dental Podcast. Very excited for this very fascinating, very huge, all-encompassing topic today on record keeping and consent. Uh, we are joined today by Sean Sellers, who is a veteran podcaster himself, uh, incisive, <laughs> decisive. I do enjoy those episodes. Um, Sean, start off, my friend. Uh, tell us about your journey and how you ended up going into this um, medical legal side. Like, you know, you've done the law and ethics masters, but tell us a bit more about yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm a general dentist. I just do what most people would consider fairly routine dentistry. I work in a, I currently work in a quite large practice in Bury St Edmunds. Um, after moving from Lincoln, where I was working for I don't know seven or eight years, um, I've always been interested in that law side of things. When I was 
uh, figuring what I wanted to do with life. Um, the options were, well, I could go and do, uh, I could be a solicitor, I could go do dentistry. And it turns out that I've done dentistry and now I've done a degree in, in law and ethics. Um, so that kind of thing has, has always been there. Um, and because as anyone that follows me on any kind of social media knows, um, I'm a little bit of a lefty, um, as you know, politically, um, that the ethics thing kind of um, fits in with that as well. So, um, yeah, a few years ago, I started on the master's course in, uh, in Bedfordshire, University of Bedfordshire, with people like Linda Cruz, who I'm sure you'll have uh, heard of. Yep. Um, mm -hmm lecturing um and Hoda Wasif who uh, is excellent she's brilliant um and yeah finished that this year um and now on to whatever's next really which I, I'm not You're quite sure. very humble because you didn't mention the fact that you got a distinction. <laughs> that's all, no, no, yeah, it okay, needs to be yeah. said. You got a, a distinction, which, which is which is a, a great feat. Uh, and I asked you before we were having a little uh, preamble before uh, Zach joined us as well about um, the, the, what is the motive for someone to do law and ethics masters? And I always thought it surely has to be a means to an end, i.e. I need to do this so that I can become a dental legal expert or something like that. Or mm. so it's, it's like when people do a PG cert in dental education, 99% mm. of these, these people are doing it because because then they can get the DF1 trainer yeah. tick box, right? Um, mm -hmm. Who's actually doing it for the for the for the you know the the merit of becoming a better educator? I don't know, right? So uh, we, we you know just just share your answer that that you gave me on that. Yeah. So so originally it was yeah let's let's try and work for dental protection or, or, or whatever. But it turns out that doing a master's in dental law and ethics isn't that great for, for doing medical legal stuff because it's not a legal degree. The focus of that is very much on the ethics, which suited me down to the ground. But it turns out that it, it has affected every single thing I do with dentistry. My research project um, that I, I finished uh, this year involved interviewing dentists and talking about non-clinical skills, uh, essentially everything apart from what you do with your hands. In dentistry and it turns out that according to my interviewees um, what you do with your hands makes up maybe 30 40 percent of your actual dentistry whereas um, everything else how you talk to your patients managing your time um, writing your notes um, understanding everything else regarding dentistry is a huge huge part of our every day and it's completely ignored we don't really get taught much of it at uni um, and from a patient's point of view they have almost no ability to adjust uh, to assess how good your dentistry is. All they know is, were they nice to me? Did it hurt? Do I want to go back? Um, and so after having discussed that with a lot of dentists, it turns out that dentistry isn't really about teeth. It's about making relationships with people, whether that's your patients, whether that's your nurse, whether that's the people you work with, whether that's other dentists. Um, so yeah, so that's that's. I think you've hit um, nail on head there, Sean. Hi, by the yeah. way. Um, Hi. <laughs> Zach, Zach is also with us, backed by popular demand, oi, oi. Uh, the, um, the creator of the Am I Naughty If series, which will make a comeback today. Don't worry. Um, uh, Zach, take take it away, mate. Um, no, I I was so as you were saying that I actually was just thinking about yesterday. Today's today's Saturday. Uh, Friday at the clinic was a tricky day for us. Friday afternoon, and there was a there was a patient who got scheduled into what we thought was a relatively straightforward forty minute space. And um, one of our associate dentists in the team, which can't be named, um, was a superhero and uh, put, a, put a superhero cape on and ended up knee deep in an extraction uh, at nearly five o'clock. And we had a new patient just after them and that was supposed to be the finish of the day. Everything went a little bit to you. And um, essentially the new patient ended up uh, delayed by about 20, 30 minutes. And we ended up with a surgical and things went a little bit tricky. And, and so, you're absolutely right. In my opinion, these things can actually be solved way, way, way earlier yeah. than or preempted way, way, way earlier than having to end up knee deep in that kind of saga. And don't get me wrong, once in a while things happen, don't they? It's Friday. Yeah. You, want, you want to help somebody out and you do think people are favouring. You're thinking, oh, he's on holiday next week and he's the partner of a, of a pre-existing, really well-known uh, patient in our practice yeah. who's very popular and, and, and is, um, you know, always looked after us and we want to look after her and her partner's in trouble. So you want to help him out, right? Um, it's all very productive to fill a space in the diary, but actually that comes with its own compound effects of, 
um, problems and things that can arise as a result of it. And it's always, it seems productive at the time, but it might be counterproductive. And that's kind of, it can be an init- initiator, can't it, of a future complaint or a future concern mm-hmm. or a future thing that spirals one thing adds to another. And that's something I was never taught as a dental student. And part of it is is experience. It comes with experience. But for example, I've I've been at work this morning. It's Saturday um I do at the moment every other Saturday, which is a killer, but we won't get oh, into that. Oh, but it's very but, tough, Sean. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, so so we, um, I had two new patients scheduled in today, and I have a very set, almost like a checklist of what I go through with new patients, because you've got to hit these, got to hit these certain things. But the checklist actual... manifesto. Yeah, yes, it's on my bookshelf there, it's one of the best books. Fantastic uh, Every author. dentist should read that book. Atul Garande is a fantastic surgeon Amazing. and a great author, yeah. Although you hit each of those marks on your, uh, your, your new patient exam, the way that you get to them is very, very different. You have to be able to judge that patient within 30 seconds of them being walking into the, or you collecting your patient into the room. And you, should, you will be talking to them in a different way. You will ask them slightly different questions to try and elicit the same answers. And none of this is technical stuff. It's having a good level of emotional intelligence, being empathetic to patients and understanding that. And actually, yeah, you can teach it. You can completely teach it, but we don't get taught it. Do you, th- do you think you can teach it? Can you always teach mm. it? As in, Brilliant can question. you teach emotional intelligence? Because I'll tell you something. Oh, go on. There's a book this that, is, that Sean's This is uh, Daniel Goleman's Emotional Intelligence, which is um, the, <laughs> the original book on emotional, well, kind of the original book on emotional intelligence. Yeah, and you, you can teach it. You can completely teach it. Really? Uh, yeah, I, 100%. I have to put that on my reading 100%. list. 100%. It? It's, okay. it's, um, to some people, it comes really naturally. Okay, some people can, and I'm, so... If you meet me out of work, I'm a um, blank-faced robot. I'm completely, completely um, useless in social situations. And, <laughs> and, um, and I used to be like that in surgery. I used to be not very confident, um, sort of quite shy. But now in... Maybe you should have done that degree in law, Sean. Yeah, yeah, maybe actually it would have been better. <laughs> but now, the way, <laughs> the way the way that I, I I I talk about it in my dissertation is that you wear these masks, you 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 mm. you act the part of the dentist, and the masks that you put on are different for different patients. So mm-hmm. if you've got a patient that's coming through that's very loud and very rambunctious, you kind of mirror that to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you've got a little old deer who's coming in. Um, who's petrified, well, you calm things down and you tone it down completely. So you've got to be able to, to, to pick that up To read, instantly. read the situation. Yeah. You've got to be able to yeah, read yeah. patients, yeah, and, and act appropriately to the situation because that's when, that's when we get into trouble. Well, two wrong. reflections there, guys. One is that the whole point of that, you, you know, we all believe in you know, equality and treating everyone the same, but actually to be a great communicator, you can't treat everyone the same. You have right. to treat everyone differently. You have to speak differently to someone on the street who is coming in wanting gold veneers versus little old lady who just needs help with her um, uh, ulcerated denture. And they're, they're different people, different uh, values, different cultures. So you have to be able to, you know, dentistry is so difficult. Because you have to deal with so many people uh, and sometimes your personality type doesn't align with your patient's mm. personality type. Mm. But the other reflection uh, I wanted to make, sorry, sorry, do you want to say something, Sean, on that? No, no, that's perfect. Absolutely right. Okay, and the other thing is we had this episode with Richard Porter. We talked about emotional intelligence and what constitutes success in dentistry. And uh, we, oh, I also asked him that question, uh, Zach, about can one, rather than can one, someone teach it, I was like, can one learn to, uh, if, they're, if they're not very emotionally intelligent, person at the moment, can they become emotionally intelligent? And, and the short answer Richard Porter gave, if you haven't listened, I think it's episode 34, go back and listen, is you have to put yourself in those awkward scenarios because that's where growth happens. It's like you have to do more reps at the gym. So you have to practice being more empathetic. You have to practice. You have to really sweat it and become in those really anxious scenarios. Only then can you then become more emotionally intelligent. Um, is there any other, any, any other nuggets you can add to that, guys? I've got something on my mind related to that, which is that I'm in a very early growth, uh, beginning of a growth journey as a practice principal. And there are some sticky conversations I'm having, which I'm not super comfortable with because I've never had to have these conversations with colleagues before. I've always been the fun-loving, easygoing associate who gets to be having bad with them at lunchtime and I've kind of taken 
uh, an evolution in my career, which I didn't really choose. I didn't really want this to happen. It just sort of evolved that way. It just almost happened by by virtue of being a dentist of in the mid thirties. And, and maybe there's other ways to design a career because five years ago I would have never have said that this would have happened. But it happens sometimes. Um, and there are scenarios where you have to kind of wear different hats, aren't there? You need to um, adapt to your surroundings. And there's always one main thing uh, to add to what you said about what Richard Porter, uh, uh, gem there he, that you gave. The thing that's always on, on my, man, my mind with this is people don't remember what you say necessarily. They always remember how you feel, how you made them feel. They don't remember what you said necessarily. They made you remember, they always remember how you made them feel. It's just that you kind of need to put yourself in their shoes and go, okay, how would you, you kind of have to remember that not everybody lives in dentistry like we do. They don't have a reference point like we do. They're fresh to this environment. Same as I'm feeling with finding with new team members who haven't come from dentistry. They've got no reference point. Um, yeah. What are the two feelings? What are the, what, what, what are the feelings you think that are most important to patients that like going, you know, patients, feeling X and Y when they come and see you. For me, I think confidence and hope. If they can have confidence and hope, then then I, I think I'm, I've done a jo good job of making them feel something I want them to feel. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Sean. I mean, you're, just to uh, um, set the scene here for everyone listening, Sean's masters was on the mammoth topic of non-clinical <laughs> communication. Like, that's just huge. Uh, and that underpins everything. Just like you're saying, underpins everything. So uh, any word on that before I ask you my more official questions? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so there's a, a few things on, on what we've just been talking about. Um, firstly, when it comes to patients, um, I think they appreciate honesty. So if you can say, look, if it's beyond your skill set, you should 100% be saying, right, I can't do this. Equally, you should be able to say, but I know someone that can. No, you should have those links with people um, either in the practice or, or, or locally, ideally, that, that can, can do that treatment. With regards to patient experience, there's something called the peak end rule. I don't know if you've heard about the peak end rule. So patients no. will take home um, the best or worst experience that they've had in your um, appointment and what happens at the end. Okay, mm. so the key thing is, if even if That's they've really had a rubbish appointment, you you make them happy at some point during that appointment, and at the end of the appointment, you're really really nice and say that that was really good, you did really well, um, that's gone excellently, uh, or you know you give them a little bit of an appraisal of the appointment and say Look, you've done really well, don't worry about it, it might be a bit sore, and you're honest with them about what's going on, and then you talk about next steps, say goodbye to them, whatever, and, and then you walk them to the front desk maybe if appropriate, and not, then you, you not know, not if not if you're in <laughs> your full PPE at the moment, but yeah, but if you can course, if you yeah, can yeah. make <laughs> if you can make sure that 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 last couple of minutes of their appointment is just spot on, mm. you'll have you have very That's, few problems with patients. You used the back. word show earlier on, and there's something I talked, I've talked to Jasmin about previously, which is that there is an element of showmanship to dentistry. Without oh, yeah. being a showman and without being a fraud and a character of your own, be yourself, mm -hmm. but there's definitely something that I have evolved in my career, which is that you are on show. We are, we're on display. We are and, it's, and it's yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And that's cool, isn't it? It's completely okay to be that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and Sean puts his, Sean, Sean puts personality on only, only on for podcasts and for his patients. He doesn't do it for anything else. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Your poor um, wife. That's <laughs> <laughs> it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this, but that's okay. It's, it's, it's okay to be that thing that you've learned. Yeah, one hundred percent. And we are, we are, we are the sum of everything that we've learned. We, we, the way that we learn from our mentors is that we, we take the best bits of what other people have talked to us about and and shown us, but more importantly, we reject the bad bits. So I will. The way that I give post op instructions from uh, from after taking a tooth out, I still use some of the phrases that my dentist was using when I was doing work experience when I was 16. Because mm. for me, it really, really sunk in and it worked really well. Um, equally, if you're talking about being a performer, Colin Campbell, who um, you've probably heard of, um, legend, especially if you've legend. listened to Incisive Decisive, I was on the, when I first met Colin, he was doing a, an oral surgery lecture. And he said that the way that he does upper eights extractions gets the patient numb, goes in there, has a look, gets the nurse to put suction in, tweaks the eight out with a 
Criers or a, a Warwick James takes his gloves off and then walks out of the room. It's it's complete showmanship. I mean, Colin's on a slightly different level than me with pretty much everything that he does. But but again, it's that uh, in in my dissertation I called it dentist as actor because we are acting the role of a dentist. And mm-hmm. for the young dentist starting, that's quite a useful thing to take on board, I think. But there the is one, also. The, Sorry, I just wanted to say one thing related to that, which is that there is an element of um, a certain generation in dentistry wanting to have, and these words were used in, in, in an interview with me, uh, with an associate, potential associate dentist not long ago, the words fake it till you make it. Now, there's a different element to that that's involved with showmanship. So it's, it's certainly worth, uh, would you agree it's worth pointing that out, that what we're talking about is something slightly different? Yeah, it is. I think there's... So you have to be confident in your skills, and which is fine, mm. but you have to know your limitations. And you have to be self-aware enough of what you can and what you can't do. So if, you, if I said to you, I can put an implant into, uh, uh, and I, you know, whatever, I can't because I don't do implants. But so you, you can just uh, make stuff, not make stuff up, but embellish the truth. But but self awareness is a pillar of emotional intelligence, isn't it? It's, it's one of the one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, so yeah. pleased you said it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, going going slightly back to, and this is my last point on what I was saying, is that mm, with please. regards to trying to trying to understand patients, trying to get on the patient's wavelength, the way that I look at it is that all you need is one hook, one little thing that you can relate to a patient with, whether it be. Um, where they go on holiday, what job they do, um, or something that you can talk to them about in a reasonable amount of depth. Um, and you can bring that around at every appointment and you can learn a little bit more about them. And if you're like me, I've got a memory like a sieve, just the worst memory in the world. Pop-up notes on your software will save your life because it's like, oh, so you went on the holiday to wherever six months ago. Um, you did this, you did that, you've got three kids. And so as you've got a little potted history of your of your patients. So they're not patients, they're people they're people first before their patients and they're certainly love people that. first before their set of teeth i love that to embellish even slightly further there's one aspect to that that i uh, uh i'd like to tie with your in with your peak end rule i presume it's not mm. actually your peak end rule but we're going to call it the peak, it is the peak peak end rule. end rule the end point for me of most conversations is tying that thing that hook into the end point because if you can leave on laughter and you can say yeah. goodbye and I sometimes I'll disappear up the stairs, my treatment room's upstairs, I'll disappear up the stairs and as I'm walking away I'll usually say something which is just a little quip, a little, by the way, enjoy yourself at the blah 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 blah. Yeah. It just goes, it tells them, he was listening to me, he actually got me, he was bothered about me, I wasn't just another one on his conveyor belt today. Absolutely, and if you've got, yeah, I, after nearly 20 years of being qualified, you've, I've got anecdotes stored from whatever and my nurse must hate me when I start rolling out the story that she's heard a thousand times before but patients love it patients love being able to talk about your dog or or you know um where that part of the world that you've been to that you've been to the same kind of area or something like that and patients really love that connection one thing which I think I'm really focusing on with the podcast and it ties in very nicely what you're saying is how do I connect with more people? How do I connect more dentists? How can I serve more dentists? And is, the, is it something that Zach is so passionate about? In fact, he named his whole clinic after this. His clinic is called Smile Stories. And nice. it's about connecting through storytelling. So you might notice about four months ago, my posts have become more story-based because I find stories are so, uh, so, so powerful. Uh, I, I think, Zach, you taught me once, uh, facts tell, stories sell. And I've always uh, taken that on board as well. And it's so true. And so I just want to highlight one thing there, which is you mentioned about uh, this bank of, of stories, essentially, you have. And I'm, and I'm a big fan of having a story bank. I think every dentist should have a story bank. Something fascinating happens. If, if you find a good way to explain something to someone, using an analogy or a story, write it down, like journal about it and have an actual physical bank of these stories because these are absolutely communication gems. Patients will be able to relate to them so much more. So I think that's, that's, that, that's that. And then to summarize the last minute, few minutes, show business. We are in show business. And just one point that I saw a Facebook point once, and I'm going a bit random here, and this dentist was basically complaining that she was as unhappy because she felt as though that inside she was miserable or, or, or in, in a way not just just not a happy bunny but then she was hating 
faking it. She was hating being nice to people, her patients, but really she felt inside like she just fed up a little bit, right? So, and, and I think her not staying true to her feelings and tr true to herself was adding to um, a degrading mental health because having to be forced to be nice to your patients, that kind of thing. But to her or someone who's going through that mental health issue, I'm not qualified to give you any advice, but what I can say is sometimes you have to own the fact that just because you are not feeling great and, and you're not feeling well, you have to be careful what image you project to the patient. And that patient is, is, is so important. Mm -hmm. and, and, and ultimately, we are in show business. So you have to learn some acting skills. You just mm -hmm. do. And it's part of it. Yeah. Hey, guys, it's Jazz here. Just interfering with this thought. At the beginning in the introduction, I told you about how I use Loom. So my biggest bugbear sometimes is capturing enough information at that new patient examination so that you can write a report or send a report. And I still make my make me clear reports. I enjoy them. Uh, but I find that sometimes when you are making uh, a comprehensive report or if like me, you use the website makemeclear.com, it, it takes time. It takes effort to sit down and sometimes you know an entire Saturday morning's gone and I've written letters to my Invisalign uh, potential patients and my brand new patients with treatment plans. It's tough work. It's time away from your children, time away from your family, time away from watching cricket and eating chips. You know, we, we love doing those kind of things. And sometimes the patient doesn't go ahead with treatment or de defers treatment. And you think, well, was it even worth it, right? So the way I've started to do it over the last eight to nine months or so is I'm using the website Loom. And you can head to www.loom.dental. That's loom.dental, L-O-O-M. And essentially, it's a software which records your screen and it can optionally record your video in the corner at the same time. So sometimes I include the video, sometimes I don't include the video. But essentially what I do is I cycle through my patient's photos and I'm speaking to the microphone. I'm saying, hey, um, hello, Mr. Smith. Here, as you can see, you've got a broken molar and I see some decay around it. Uh, and then I also see this issue, and you told me at the, at the examination appointment that your main goal is to be able to chew steak better, and therefore, here are my recommendations, here are my fees, uh, is this something that you think you'd be interested in, right? So it, it, it's less, I mean, personally, I hate typing, I hate writing, I hate um, note writing, I do, I really hate it. I really enjoy speaking to the camera, as you know, right? So for some of you, your personality trait will actually suit better to write letters, and that's fine. But for me, I'm, I'm, I'm really quick at this. I send like a five-minute video video plan to a patient, uh, which got all the information in there. Uh, and I much prefer doing that. And I'm faster at doing that than to, um, you know, insert the individual photos into a Word document, type different things. I'm just quicker. And it's easier for me to just say these things. And what then happens is that when the patient watches the video, you get an automatic email, which is linked to your Loom account saying, hey, Mr. Smith has just watched the video. And I've told Mr. Smith what to do as the next steps. And I think this is good because of um, consent issues shoes like if, if, if the proverbial hits the fan in the future, you have a video record of everything that you might have said to a patient and stays on the cloud, right? Which is great. Uh, the other thing is that it's efficient. It's really quick and easy for me to make these videos. Uh, and, and then eventually when a patient uh, wants to go ahead, if I feel it's a quite a substantial treatment plan, I need to break it down a bit more. I need to give an appointment schedule. Uh, I want to um, double up on my consent process, if you like, which is which something that we discuss in the next episode. Um, I will then also follow it up with a comprehensive written report. But at least now I know my patient's committed. They paid a deposit. They're booked in or they're wanted. They're very keen to book in. They've told me they like what they saw in that video. So if you if you like that, try it out. Give it a go for yourself. Uh, Loom have recognized how, uh, how it can work in the in the workflows of dentists as well hence why you can visit loom.dental i think they do like a 14-day free trial and even the free version free forever version is good but it's limited to about five minutes something it's really it's really cheap it's about 70 pounds for the whole year uh, or 96 dollars something so it's great value uh if you like the idea check it out and i actually use this to communicate with my team my producer my editor uh, we all communicate via loom uh, how-to videos and whatnot so it's, it can be used for your team as well you can make like a manual of all the how-to videos how to find this file or how to generate that report and you can make these little manual of, of Loom videos. So I hope that gives you some inspiration, some ideas of how you can use the modern softwares that we have today. Back to the episode. And you've got to be able to compartmentalize things as well. So mm. you can't, you can't, so say you've got a patient where everything goes wrong. Um, yeah, that abstraction that's gone into a surgical, um, it's taking you forever and you're shattered and you feel a bit rubbish, but you can't let that drag on to the next patient. You've got to be able to mm. 
completely stop, move on. And that that is hard. That's one of the, the most difficult things I, I've learned to do. I don't quite know how you do it, but you just learn to do it. And then at the end of the day, you can decompress and, and sort of analyze things. But I, I'm not a great fan of going, right, let's, let's analyze this now and let it affect the rest mm-hmm. of my day. It's shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. And then when, once you've got time to chill out, that, for my lunch times are... I'm really antisocial because I just sit and just completely do nothing for an hour or half an hour or whatever, whatever I've got to do, because I just want that time to myself. Your, your, your ability to cope with that is your ability to your, your method. Um, yeah. and, and, that, and it is coping to, to some extent. It sounds as though you're drowning every day and they're using the word coping, but it, it really, you know, there is, everyone has to have their own ability, their own method. Um, I, I, I go for a little wander to the shop every day, whether I need lunch or not, it's just part of my routine. And, and I need to do that because it's my switch off from the morning and I can recoup and go, what am I, what am I doing this afternoon and get your head back in the game. Um, it really does depend on the type of clinic that you've either built yeah. or you've become part of though, because speed and pace is one of the things that comes becomes a factor in there, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Doesn't it? So if you if you're t- looking after a conveyor belt every day, it is a nightmare yeah, to go up and down that many times. Yeah, completely, completely. And, and, and talking about my my lovely wife, bless her. Uh, there's nothing worse than than coming home in dentist mode. So so <laughs> you know that is you need to lose that before before you get home as well. Guys, I've, I really enjoyed this um, introductory chat. I, I I mean, wow, there's so many takeaways there. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit more official now and just ask you um, about this mammoth topic of record keeping, all right? Mm-hmm. So the, the angle that I'm coming in to make it really tangible for those listening is record keeping has seen a big shift over the years from um, in the days in the 90s where it might be like, you know, S&P, and then your little signature and how much you charge the patient. Uh, amazing when you see those um, paper paper notes and that's all that's written. This is absolutely crazy compared to um, absolute exhaustion in the way of the use of templates, which are mm-hmm. just laborious. Uh, a simple 15-minute exam might have several thousand words of, of notes. How can we make appropriate and good notes? I'm sorry, that's a crazy question. But anything we could help us <laughs> with record and keeping, where do we notes. start? Appropriate and good. I thought we were getting okay. great at this, Jazz. Yeah. Appropriate and good <laughs> notes. Honestly, You've been doing this for a while now. I've been thinking about this Surely. question. I've been thinking about this question. Right? I, I don't know how else to, to put it. Like, what, what, How can we become good at record keeping? How can we uh, not have to produce thousands of words? Or is that what we have to do? And how can we um, overcome this uh, template nonsense yeah. that template we have going hell. on template hell yeah um so let's get this straight exam s p has never been good enough notes that's <laughs> that's the first thing there's this nostalgia for, for the sure. time where you could just write for sure. oh exactly <laughs> and i used to, when i qualified 2002 we were taught we were taught to write decent notes and then as soon as i went into practice ah, exam s p that was the <laughs> way it was done equally your notes are supposed to be a contemporaneous record of what you've just done Okay, so contemporaneous means um, they have to be done at the time of the appointment. So if you're uh, if you're a barrister and you're looking at some notes, let's get let's really come down really heavy on someone now. Um, If you haven't written those notes before your next patients come in, they're not contemporaneous. So that's Mm -hmm. the first thing to say. So people that save their notes up to do them um, via a cloud system. um, Guilty. uh, yeah, Guilty. yeah. Don't, uh, don't do that. I do don't catch do that. up. Don't do that every day. I mean, every every now and again we do it, but but try not to do that. Yeah, equally, that's fair, if, fair. if if you're writing three or four pages of notes for an examination or whatever, that's what. Why? Why are you doing that? Who is that benefiting? It's not going to save you from being sued because the chances are what you've written is not really that relevant to the patient that you've seen. Mm-hmm. So you've got to find this balance of being able to be concise but accurate. So when I'm doing – so I use, um, I use a, a bit of software co- called Kuroku to do mm-hmm. almost all my notes. Um, and Kuroku is a system where you have lots of clickable buttons. You set up a certain number of templates and um, – when you're doing your exam or doing your treatment, my nurse clicks on a lot of the buttons, fills in a lot of the things. Um, and after I'm done, I spend maybe 30 seconds, a minute, filling the rest in, uh, copying and pasting it into my notes. So with software like that, it takes a bit of setting up. 
Um, they have their mm-hmm. own sort of templates. But I mean, uh, Sean, I, do you use SOE or Dentally? What, what are you using? What uh, software? So I, we use Exact, yeah, so SOE. Um, okay, but, so but, how, how is that different or superior to uh, custom screens, which Zach and I are, are quite yeah. big fans of? Mm. Um, tell us about that. So with, so I don't... Uh, just, just explain what, for people listening who maybe don't know, just, can you just explain what custom screen is as well, please? Yeah, so custom screens are, um, from what I understand, little tick boxes. Um, that you can say, yeah. So that drop downs, tick boxes. Yeah, it's actually boxes, yeah. yeah. So the difference between custom screens and something like Kuroku is that I can have all the information you've got on your tick boxes, but then I can go in and amend it, add little notes, say, look, there's a bit of borderline ish pocketing here on this upper left that, re- that I really need to keep a close eye on. And that's, that's intermingled with all those what would be tick boxes. So mm-hmm. the way that I look at notes is that it should be a narrative. It should tell the story of the appointment. So from checking your medical history to what, exactly what you've done in exactly what order and then say goodbye to the patient. Um, the, the thing that I find with custom screens is they don't tell the story as well as having that customized way of doing things. So for example, most of our checkups are the same, aren't they? We do... Generally, we have a set system. We do this, 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 and this, and we generally do it in this order. So for my, for my exam template, it's that. It is the order that I go through my exam with mm-hmm. a little discussion bit at the end that I type in um, and then treatment plan and recommended treatment and what they need to come back for, if anything. Mm-hmm. Um, for my filling appointment, if we're doing a composite, most of the time our composites follow a fairly set rigid rule. Again, and so it should do because that's called a uh, protocol, right? I mean, exactly, exactly, highlight yeah, exactly. the young dentist. The whole point so, of clinical protocols is so you're not guessing what works and what doesn't work. Mm, you have a protocol exactly, and you stick to it. Exactly. So, so there's obviously there's there's wiggle room in that protocol, but the basics are exactly the same. So the way that I look at uh, software like Kuroku is they give you that basics and you edit in the wiggle room. And mm. and things like uh, with Kuroku in particular, it's got some um, magic machine learning type thing so if you've got if you're doing something routinely that's different than the template that you've got well it has the it adds it in automatically Mm -hmm. i don't know how it does it it is literally magic and that for me is better than a custom screen because it is a little bit more customizable on a patient by patient basis or better than what most dentists are using, which is just oh, preformed like templates. Oh, and then what you're having to do is you delete, 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 delete. So it's, it's yeah. less additive and more subtractive as you go yeah, through yeah, your notes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where you get into trouble. So, so you are never gonna, you're never going to get in trouble for customizing your notes. The time you're going to get in trouble is by using templates and forgetting to take bits out. So, so Classic with, one being the lower molar extraction and then warning the patient about a sinus. Of an OAC, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Because <laughs> then, then you know that, that you, you, whoever's, been, whoever's done that appointment just hasn't paid attention to their notes. Therefore, does that mean that it, it casts doubt on the rest of the note keeping? Yeah, it makes you look, uh, to, well, it just makes clearly, it makes the, the, the notes look n- invalidated, doesn't it? Oh, completely, it, yeah, it, completely. It, it, it doesn't, make, doesn't make any sense, it doesn't tell the story, like you say. And, and it, it, are we right in thinking, Sean, um, that even if somebody comes in for a treatment appointment, which is predetermined, pre-booked and whatever else, they should still have some notes related to beginning at the beginning of con- current concerns. Okay, I, I yeah, try to absolutely. avoid complaint, yeah. by I, the way, because was... <laughs> that tends to become language that you then use in front of a patient and complaint then mm. makes the person sound so like a complainer. Yeah, 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 so yeah. there's Very subtleties good, to that. Yeah, that, that yeah go on. Um, yeah, so the way that I tend to work, let me think, is a patient comes in, they sit down, have a little chat, say that this is what we're planning to do today because that's part of your consent process, which we'll come on to later, I'm sure. Um, and, and then ask them if they've got any questions uh, and see if they've got anything else that's, that's more pressing. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's always, always worthwhile having a little preamble with the patient beforehand, um, no, no matter what they do. Partly because it's part of that we're treating people rather than... So if someone's just come in and had a really bad day, um, their dog's just died, but they've come to your appointment and they don't really feel up to the appointment. Well, actually, maybe you should reschedule that three tooth extraction or whatever, because maybe they've got other things that they need to be thinking about. Do you know what I mean? Chaz, I don't mm-hmm. want to put words in your mouth, but can we make this tangible? 
<laughs> Do you know that's become Jazz's pretty... catchphrase, by the way, Sean? <laughs> Jazz's favourite catchphrase because he just says it 500 times an episode. Is make it, let's make, it. This, let's make it. this tangible. Let's make this tangible. So, Sean, Jazz, you've got to come on. I can't say it. You've got to say it. Sean, can you make it? Can you make that tangible? <laughs> <laughs> could you give us? Could you give us something along the lines of? So, what is your preamble? Somebody comes in for a predetermined, prearranged, sixty-minute restoration appointment. What do you yeah. say? So, um, hello, Miss Smith. How are you doing? Come have, have a sit down. Have a sit down. Always, always. So, I always stand in the same place. Actually, that's not true. I've, I've, um, I've changed where I sit in my surgery. So, the, you have to understand where I'm, where I'm coming from. I've got a chair here. And I have a post that I lean against, so much so that the colour of my scrubs has rubbed off onto the area. <laughs> Love it. I've got a but, wall that I lean against. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I've realised that I've also got a very large window in front of me with a windowsill that's about two foot off the ground. Oh, that I can, it's a deep lovely. Wall that I can sit on yes. and come up face to face with patients at their eye level. So um, depending on the patient, I will either lean on this bit of wall that's blue with my scrubs or s- <laughs> or sit on on the windsill and have a chat with them about it and if they've for a lot of my patients certainly at the moment they've been going through a bit of a tough time because it's been a bit rubbish for the last year and a half for a lot of people so I have a bit of a chat um and if there's something that's been going on like for example, their husband or wife's been having chemo, what's been going on with this, have, have a little chat about that. So you know, so you, you're instantly, you're humanising yourself and um, to them and them to you. So again, you're having a personal, personal reaction, uh, interaction with, with patients. And then as part of my consent process, I say, right, okay, so plan of action for today. Plan of action for today is my classic phrase. As soon as my nurse hears plan of action for today, her ears prick up because then I go through what we want to do. So um, we're gonna, you've got this old filling that is, is with some decay underneath it, for example. Um, we're going to replace that for you today. So big pitch the thing to start with. Um, and then I go through, so a bit of anaesthetic. While you're going numb, we're going to put all our PPE on. And then we're going to use something called a rubber dam. And then I explain what a rubber dam is and why we use it. And then we're going to take the filling out. And then we're going to clear out any decay underneath there. Make sure it's nice and clean and put a new filling in. Should be nice and straightforward. Or, actually, this one's quite deep. So there might be a few things that, that may well um, change the way that we have to look at things. So because it's quite close to the nerve, the risk there is that X, Y, and Z. And then if that happens this will happen and then this will happen. So you're going through every single, po- not every single, the, the most common things that may go wrong in that appointment. But if you explain them to your patient beforehand, they haven't gone wrong because you have a plan. Mm-hmm. If you have to take your rubber dam off and, and, and do whatever, and you haven't warned the patient about that, you are already fighting a losing battle because Although you've probably planned for it, your patient doesn't know that you've planned for it. So what you're doing is you're you're fighting that fire, aren't you? Mm-hmm. So if it you've already told minute, the patient, it? it just and, and it is a really important part of the process because your patient is there on the side, on your side, mm-hmm. and you can say, "Look, I don't think this is going to happen, but there is a risk that that's going to happen." Or you can say, "Actually, there's quite a high risk that this is going to happen, and if this does happen, this is what we're going to do." Mm-hmm. Um, it's also worth making it the patient's responsibility. Can I also just add, add, add that one thing there? Because um, Zach, add that, but I also want you, Zach, if there's anything you do differently, let's, let's use this as an opportunity as, okay, as so, colleagues just to discuss so, how we do things, uh, which might be very different. I'll, I'm happy to tell you what I do, but Zach, you go first. My method with that is very similar to Sean. Um, I will always have, and, and the nurses in our team are trained, so there's one thing to definitely say pre- preemptively for this. This comes down to teamwork. This is not a process you can do alone. And any dentist who's one year out of university and is about to start like a, a, the first week in their new job listening to this is thinking, oh, this is straightforward. I, I've got this. I've got this down. But if your nurse, for example, is on it and has got photographs on the screen and radiographs and all that kind of stuff, then you don't look like a faffer. You don't look like you're kind of making up as you go along. You're actually there. You're on it. And you can then explain. So my method, I've explained and shared some of this with you, with you before, Jazz. Um, I call it a, it's called a benefit procedure feature statement. So that's my initial kickoff, which is usually benefit first, so that we can minimise your chance of this tooth becoming painful at some point. What we've planned, as you know, um, is that we're going to do X, Y, and Z procedure um, in patient-friendly terms. 
And the benefit of doing this early, proactively, is that we're trying to ch reduce the chance of the same thing happening. Do you remember that tooth last year, Mrs. Smith? Usually it's Josie, the first name terms is typically how I work. Um, so do you remember that tooth last year when you were on holiday, Josie? Um, part of it broke off and then you came in quite a lot of pain. So we're trying to prevent and be proactive for the future. Is that what we'd expected today? Or sometimes I do it reverse and I say, just to make sure we're on the same page as each other, what are you expecting today? Let's just make sure we kick off on the right foot kind of thing. And when you embellish like that, I tend to find that people are kind of on the side and they're, uh, we've called it co-discovering before, Jazz, where you're kind of co-discovering people's diagnoses, but actually for a treatment appointment like this, um, the scenario we've just laid out, what you're trying to do is just kind of co-plan together. You're kind of going, let's just make sure we get this. I also start with subtle things like, by the way, um, let's say you started the appointment 10 minutes delayed. Thanks for your patience today. By the way, are we keeping you from anything? Or are you dashing back to work? Or Because we started talking earlier on in this podcast about how to keep people on side. Like you said, Sean, they're people first. And an easy way to, sorry to use this word, but piss people off, is actually cut into their day. It's to yeah. mess them around. It's to mean they're there late to pick their kids up from school. It's a very quick way to get people off site. And then on top of that, if you're telling me, okay, you didn't even prep pro properly, so you had to take a rubber dam off with an exposure and the rest of it to go, oh, what are we gonna do now? Look like a right Muppet. Then what happens is they go home and go, it was late, it was rubbish, he charged me too much and he drilled into my nerve. That's how bad things mm. happen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and you, the one thing you said there was, yeah, thanks for waiting. Because it's, it's never, uh, sorry, sorry, we're late. It's always thank you for waiting. Um, mm. and especially at the moment with that's everything, else right that, yeah, everything else that's going on, I'm pre-preparing patients for treatment appointments saying, look, at the moment, Appointment times are a bit like when you're at school and your teacher said the bell's for me, not for you, because at the moment we're having to set <laughs> I up. I love that. We're, we're, having to set <laughs> up, we're having to set up everything before we get you in because I can't open drawers when I'm in. And then um, once you're gone, we have to do some various bits and bobs before we can clean down. So although I'm booking you in for an hour, you probably won't be sat in the chair for an hour, but you might be sat in the waiting room for a little while before you come in. So they're already pre-prepared. That is so then, good. But yeah, so that that's it's it's being able to preempt any issues that come along and then you look like yeah you're planning for things which you are because we do that we plan for things otherwise you know we wouldn't be even half decent dentists if we didn't realize what was going to happen once you take that composite out and take all the carriers out and then try, you know and then it's also important to uh, and the only final thing i had to add to that was um when uh, you then describe, for example, a radiograph or a photograph of somebody's tooth on the screen. And um, there's nothing better than a visual, by the way. We're back in the day when I was showing them tiny little, you know, like a size two radiograph film, old school processing. Can you see that tiny little dot there? And they're like, no, because <laughs> they haven't seen 400 radiographs like you have. <laughs> so, um, yes, basically, um, uh, if you then can explain it to them in, them in their terms to say, this is, Josie, this is a deep cavity in this tooth. Um, we, we've really caught this as soon as we could possibly feasibly get to it. But there is something to say, which is that there could be secondary things that need to be happened or discussed later. Um, we're going to get you out of trouble today. We're going to keep it safe. We're going to aim to do everything possible so you go home with no discomfort or very minimal discomfort as possible. But that said, there's likely to be a follow-up, blah, 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 blah. And I tend to say the words likely or unlikely because you don't want to put yourself... Don't go... Can't go too black and white. There's always no. a grey area in healthcare. Is yeah, that and at the, end, at, at the end, yeah, very much so. At the end of the appointment as well, a little recap. Like it's gone really well. It's gone really smoothly. You might get a little bit of discomfort, especially where we've given the anaesthetic, but that should calm down. So they know exactly what to expect, and also to contact you if something is different. Mm. So, or if, but if it comes really painful, just get straight on the phone. Give us a ring. Don't hesitate. Don't suffer in silence. Um, mm. And again, they appreciate being talked to like a person, not just like a, a walking set of teeth. I also, along similar lines, use the words to reduce the risk of mm -hmm. or to maximize your chance of mm -hmm. a lot. It's not mm -hmm. to, to make this pain free. There's always gonna be a little, yeah. you know, you need to give yourself wiggle room. If you pitch mm -hmm. yourself as the pain free dentist and you even, they can even feel a pinch of local going in, you're not a pain free dentist. Well said. And I just want to share um, just so, something I do. So I do all those things that you guys, uh, guys say, thankfully. Uh, one different thing that I, I, I do sometimes at the beginning of the appointment uh, before we then talk about consent is um, something that was I was inspired by an anaesthetist whom I saw because uh, the year is 
two, I'm trying to think. The year is 2008. It's Manchester United and Liverpool. No, Manchester United and Chelsea playing in the Champions League final. I think it was Moscow. Boom. I was in a pub in Hounslow uh, watching that match. Uh, Man United won. I was really happy. Uh, and uh, I was walking back home in Hounslow, which is at night, late at night, which is not a smart thing to do. Uh, and I um, stumbled across some Chelsea fans who proceeded to uh, headbutt me and uh, hence why I've got a dodgy nose, if you ever wondered. Uh, and um, anyway, they did a, wow. the, the worst nose procedure ever because they didn't improve it at all. But anyway, the anaesthetist, when he was talking to me, he walks in uh, and he goes to me, what are you having done today? I'm like, uh, and, and the way he said it was, I didn't even think he knew what, what was happening today, the way he said it, right? It really took me by surprise. I was like, um, I'm having this procedure. It's like, all right. And he's like, Why? And then I clocked, oh, this is, this is awesome. Okay, I'll this, this, this. And do you know what could go wrong? And I was like, uh, yeah, this. So I, I love that. And sometimes uh, I use that sometimes. I don't know, it depends on my mood. It's not, my, it's not every patient, but sometimes say, do you know what you haven't done today? Why are we doing it? What could go wrong? Very good. Let's get started. And, I, and, I, and I, it's just for some personality types, that might work better as well. So yeah. it's something I'd like to do. Yeah, that's interesting. I think you have to judge judge your patient on that one, though. Judge your patient for sure. <laughs> Big time. That, that, that can come across as quite a pragmatic and, and quite a sort of mm, slightly more old school way to do things. You know, the paternalistic, <laughs> I'm the clinician type of approach. Yeah. But to be fair, yeah. some people will bounce, off, bounce well off that type of thing. Um, Absolutely. There is a, a risk of something like that. And by the way, this is something I was taught by the oral surgeons um, in, uh, in Sheffield as an undergrad they can come across quite like that by saying things like, do you remember jazz being taught? So what do you, what, what, uh, what do you, what do, what do they teach us to say exactly before you take an, before you take a tooth out, before you do an extraction? Was it something like, so what's happening today? Or what is it you're doing, we're doing for you today? The, the okay. risk is that you can come across, the, like you say, that you don't know yourself. You don't know what you know. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. So that, that was very apparent. You're trying to right. consent that person, but actually you can come across as you've kind of not quite mm -hmm. planned ahead. So careful. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. But the, 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 I think the, the crux of it is sometimes to ask questions to, to validate their understanding, I, I think is, is a good way to, to do it in certain procedures. Um, which leads me nicely to consenting patients yeah. uh, and... Um, uh, Sean, I mean, th th this is something that I know you're quite hot on. There we have it, guys. Hope you enjoyed that lovely chat with Sean and Zach. And we'll be seeing you next time when we talk about the consent process. If you like this episode, please do give us a five-star review. If you found this conversation interesting, why don't you share it with one of your colleagues? That's how my podcast grows, and I'd really appreciate it. Thanks so much.